All right, now we're in the winery, and we're going to uh, we're going to purchase our 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 juice. You got to know somebody who's got the juice, or you have to buy a kit. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you're using fresh juice, you're going to have a lot more luck with high quality wine than if you use a kit. If you fill two three gallon carboys with two and a half gallons of juice, you're going to end up with a five gallon carboy of wine when you're done. So that the aging and settling process, you have a full carboy that'll be all the way up to the neck, which is where you want to be in order to avoid oxidation. Now, this, this part you're normally not going to have to deal with. This is just so my cover doesn't cave in, because there's a uh, variable capacity cover on top of this tank. What I have here is a hydrometer. And this is a basic tool of a winemaker. It's a basic tool of a scientist, actually. But for winemaking, we can read it in specific gravity, which water has a specific gravity of one. And, and then uh, as the sugar comes up, uh, the specific, specific gravity will get a little incrementally higher. Whereas in the wine business, we use bricks. Bricks is roughly percent sugar. So, uh, so like 10 bricks would be 10% sugar. Where we usually uh, come out with uh, wines, uh, uh, most of the wines we, or I should say juices, most of the juices we get um, are about 21 to 25 bricks, which means they're about 25% sugar. Now, the only reason this is important to measure is because you can calculate what your alcohol is gonna be based on the initial sugar. Because you ferment it all the way to dry, which means you're converting all of the sugar into alcohol, and therefore, you can, there's an easy conversion that says this much sugar will give you 12.5% alcohol. Very, very simple calculation. So, the other, there's other methods of determining how much alcohol you have, but uh, measuring the initial sugar is the easiest by far, and the cheapest. Uh, the reason you're uh, swishing it around like this is uh, they tend to like to hold bubbles, and that'll bring it up higher, giving you a false reading that'll say it's got more sugar than it really does. So now, you probably can't see this from there, but I'm gonna let it drop. And I'm going to read it for you. This has exactly 21 bricks, which means 21% sugar. That's where we're going to start out. That's going to give us roughly 12% alcohol, which uh, um, 21 bricks actually is a really, really nice point for a white because that way the, the alcohol isn't too high. Uh, you get 25 bricks in a white grape, then uh, you almost have to dilute it down a little bit because the alcohol is just too pronounced, and that just makes for a very bad, uh, uh, a very bad um, mouthfeel. You know, if, if there's too much alcohol, it tastes like you're drinking brandy. But uh, when we want to drink wine, especially a white wine in the summertime, we don't want that forward alcohol flavor. Okay, now that we have our carboys full. Now things start getting exciting. This is where we're going to actually start making wine. So before we start that, I'm going to give you a little bit of um, a little bit of uh, insight as to the equipment you need, or the, in this case, the small amount of equipment you need. What we have here is we have two three-gallon carboys, which they're made of glass, so they're very easy to sterilize. You can get these six-gallon buckets and do this whole operation in one bucket. But I'm telling you right now, if you don't like the taste of oxygenated wine, then buckets are very, very hard to make wine in without getting it oxygenated. When you're first fermenting, you got carbon dioxide that's coming up and it's protecting the wine. But as soon as that fermentation stops, that oxygen gets in there and starts attacking that wine and making it bad. Carboys, on the other hand, they're very easy to control because you've got an opening that big. And this uh, trap here, 
keeps the oxygen keeps the carbon dioxide coming out but it won't let oxygen back in therefore these are a much safer bet and they're they're not a whole lot more expensive than the buckets a little bit you know these are like 20 bucks or something like that each and i'm telling you the buckets last 10 years which is pretty good but these will last a lifetime as long as you don't drop them so what we have is the two carboys. These are three gallon carboys, and the reason you pick three gallon carboys is we have two and a half gallons of juice in each one of these carboys. When this is full, when these are done, we can uh, strain this into a five gallon carboy and it'll be up to the top. And again, that's for oxygen control. Um, when you're first starting out, oxygen is something you probably don't even want to worry about because it, it'll drive you crazy. But uh, I talked about oxygen in, in my common mistakes um, video that uh, I'll put a link to down in the description. And uh, it's, a, it's a major problem for those discerning wine drinkers that don't like the taste of oxygen. So now, with that all being said, we have our two carboys, we have two stoppers, and we have, we have traps on the top, okay? And these traps, there's a hole in the stopper and you just stuff them in there just like they are and you can either put water in these or you can put alcohol in them. And I put alcohol in them because um, you can set these in a, in a freezer or cold weather and you don't have to worry about this uh, freezing. The wine's not gonna freeze because it's got, it, it's got a lot of sugar in it and in, uh, it's gonna start producing alcohol. So, uh, and wait, the reason you do that, this time of year, temperature control, if your wine starts heating up, you can set it outside, let it cool off a little bit so that we maintain that nice 55 to 60 degree temperature. Okay, so enough on that. Uh, the uh, other uh, two things we have here, three things, is uh, we have our yeast. This happens to be uh, um, Lelvin uh, QA23 yeast, which is a good yeast for white wine. We have our yeast nutrient, which we don't normally put this in until we're about halfway fermented, but when we're gonna, we're gonna start the yeast uh, brewing outside of the carboy, uh, we're gonna put a dash of this in there just to help the yeast get started. Then we have the last thing here is Camden tablets. This is uh, pre-measured potassium metabisulfite. Uh, this, every winemaker uses this, uh, but these are handy for for uh, home winemakers because they're already measured out. You don't need to buy yourself uh, an expensive scale or anything like that. There's an app on Wine Business Monthly's website that uh, has uh, wine, wine calculations. And uh, one of them is uh, um, sulfur dioxide. And you can either buy liquid sulfur dioxide or you can use potassium metabisulfite, which Camden tablets are potassium metabisulfite. Like I said, half a gram per tablet. Usually uh, uh, one or two tablets is all you're gonna put in at a time, depending on how much, uh, how much you want. This does two things. This helps, uh, helps keep the oxygen from doing too much damage, the oxygen that's already in there. And it also controls bacteria, which is the more important part of this is the bacteria. If you don't keep this, keep the levels of sulfur dioxide up at least to, uh, depending on the wine, uh, the pH is a big uh, factor. Uh, you want to keep it up uh, 20, 30, 40 ppm so that uh, you don't get uh, levels of uh, spoilage bacteria hurting your wine and making it taste bad. So this is something uh, all winemakers use. You really can't live without it unless you're going to make it and it's going to be drank within a week or two, which uh, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I can't drink that much wine that fast, even if I have my, all my friends over. All right, so where we are is um, uh, this here, you'll see this, the one last thing, I, I said that was the last thing, but this is the last thing. This is basically Everclear. It's uh, a grain alcohol. It's, uh, this happens to be 100, 150 or 170 proof. And what we do with this is uh, we can spray the outside of this so there's no bacteria on it. We could take this before we, you know, before we put it on there, we spray it out a little bit with uh, grain alcohol. We uh, wipe it off and, uh, and now we have a very sterile surface. At, at 150 proof, this kills everything. As we all know nowadays, based on uh, the use of hand sanitizers, this is quite a bit more 
uh, effective than even a hand sanitizer. With that being said, you put a little on your hands, kill all the, uh, the stray bacteria and yeast on your hands because those can get in the wine too. Okay, so now we're ready to actually put the yeast in and we'll get our handy dandy little knife out here again. You can tear these, but uh, I'm just gonna cut it because it's gonna be nice and clean. So, we're just gonna dump the yeast in there. And uh, we have two packets here, but uh, actually this, uh, they, they put five grams in here, and five grams is enough for five gallons, which this is. So what we'll do is, uh, We'll save the second one and uh, we'll mix this one up and split it up. Now, if you watch certain, uh, certain other uh, YouTubes, they'll tell you you can dump the yeast directly in there. That's not a problem. You can do that. It just, uh, it, to me, it just doesn't start as well. And uh, you're taking a chance that the yeast won't, won't get off to a healthy start. To me, if you start it this way, the yeast's gonna stay healthy and like I said, uh, if you've ever had hydrogen sulfide problems, you'll be glad you took care of that yeast. You take care of them, they'll take care of you. So now we're just gonna stir this up a little bit. You don't have to, you don't have to stir it up, but uh, uh, the reason I stir it up uh, is uh, uh, I normally, uh, <laughs> when I'm wine making, uh, I'm using uh, 500 gram bags, and uh, when you use a 500 gram bag of this and you dump it in there, if, you, if you're not careful and stir it while you're adding it, you end up with great big, uh, walnut sized clumps and uh, that's not good. So now, uh, this here, uh, this here, the, the yeast on this thing right here becomes a contaminant once, you're, once your wine is done, sterile, and, uh, and you're ready to bottle. Uh, this will destroy a sweetened wine. If you, uh, if you add sugar back in, if, you know, you add sugar back in and then you sterile filter it, and then say I would forget and stir it with this rod without being clean. Uh, you just introduced a whole bunch of yeast into your nice sterile wine and now it's gonna re-ferment in the bottle and you're gonna start popping corks. And like I said, uh, that's another thing I covered in my uh, six wine making mistakes video. And uh, I recommend uh, going through going through the motions to start this out, but then looking at that uh, six mistakes video before you ever start because it might just save you a batch of wine. Okay, so now we got this, uh, this all started here and really you have to leave it sit for about an hour. And the thing you can do to help it out even a little more is add about maybe an ounce of, uh, of uh, juice and I'm not gonna make you watch me uh, dump uh, juice all over the place, so I'll just, uh, I'll just tell you, you're just gonna add a, an ounce of juice, and what that'll do is it'll give it a little bit of sugar to get started, because uh, uh, sugar and acid, because yeast is, uh, it kinda likes things not to change too much at once. So if you start it out with a little bit of juice in it, then it's already getting used to the juice before you actually introduce it into the carboys. All right, I'll let you watch me try to dump a little bit of juice into this, into this yeast slurry. If I'm lucky, I won't drop the whole carboy and all. There we go, not bad, not bad. So we're gonna give it one little more stir. And now we're gonna let it sit for about an hour, okay? When you first get the, uh, the juice, you want to have about 30 ppm uh, of uh, sulfur dioxide in there right away. And what that's going to do is it's going to protect it from the oxygen. Uh, that right now there's not a whole lot of microbes that are going to affect it badly besides yeast. But uh, the oxygen will affect it badly. So you want to protect it, especially if you're not going to get it fermenting right away. You want at least 30 ppm uh, sulfur dioxide in there. And that would be... Uh, about one Camden tablet, uh, probably one Camden tablet for each one of these. Okay, it is an hour later, and I don't know if you can see this or not, but we have a little bit of foaming in there, which is pretty normal for once uh, once the yeast starts uh, 
starts becoming uh, activated, it starts producing carbon dioxide, and uh, um, sometimes you got to be careful because it'll foam up, and and if you're not careful, you can run it right over the top of uh, of a container. But uh, that's why you use like this a much bigger container than what you need, so that it has room to uh, to grow to roll up. Uh, and with that in mind, that's why we have the level down here in these carboys as well, because if uh, if it gets uh, fermenting fast enough, you'll get foaming in there and the foam level will come up. And if you don't have enough headspace in there, it'll just come right off the top. And then some, first it'll start shooting out the vent and then it'll just pop the whole cork right off. And you'll have a big mess to clean up. And for any of you guys who are watching this that are already home wine makers, you've probably had that occur already. So now, carefully remove that. Uh, we have our alcohol in here, it's all ready to go. And uh, we're just going to uh, gently stir this a little bit and we're gonna put half, there's about 200 milliliters in here, so we're gonna put half into this carboy. Not quite. And the other half will go into this carboy. Okay, and uh, some uh, people will tell you to stir this up really well, but uh, you don't have to. Uh, it stirs itself up. Once, once the fermentation starts, uh, it gets kind of like a, uh, a circulation going in there from, uh, from the carbon dioxide. It's like a, a fizzy bottle of beer, which uh, is the same. It's the same thing causing the, the fizz as carbon dioxide, but in this case, it's fermentation. So uh, now, now with this all being said, the uh, one thing you can do is uh, clean up your bottles, your carboys a little bit. And uh, the, uh, the one thing uh, I mentioned earlier is sanitation is uh, extremely important. Not as important at this phase of winemaking as it is once the wine is fermented, but uh, it, it's always important. It's just uh, at this point, we have, uh, you know, in one day or two days, we're going to have literally billions of yeast cells um, thriving in there, and they pretty much uh, they pretty much crowd out anything else that could possibly live in there. So for that, you know, and then it's it's carbon dioxide too. The yeast produces carbon dioxide, and there's not much else that can live in a carbon dioxide atmosphere besides uh, yeast and uh, there's a few uh, microorganisms, other microorganisms that can uh, live in uh, carbon dioxide environment, but uh, uh, not a lot of them. And not a lot that we're worried about at this point. So uh, with that all being said, uh, now we're gonna wait uh, for a couple of, uh, you know, if it's warm enough, uh, what I will say is that uh, You'll see uh, the warmer you start the wine out, the, the juice out at, the, the quicker it'll start fermenting. If you start this all out at about 75 degrees, uh, this is going to be fermenting really, really hard by tomorrow. We started out at about 55 degrees, which is, uh, if you're a uh, discerning winemaker who wants to keep the fruity flavors in there, uh, 55 to 60 degrees is where you want to ferment this. And, uh, and uh, with that being said, uh, at the colder temperatures, which 55 to 60 is, you want to make sure you keep that yeast healthy. And, uh, and this is that's part of this yeast nutrient thing. Because uh, cold temperatures, just like with people, uh, the colder it is, the less they thrive. So you uh, want to keep your yeast healthy. You want to uh, make sure that it doesn't drop too much below 50. You want to make... Uh, make absolute sure that it doesn't go over 80, but with a small carboy like this, it's not gonna be a problem. With a tank like this, then once you, uh, once you start fermenting, this will heat up and it'll go up to uh, 90 degrees, kill all the yeast, and now you got a stuck ferment. So uh, yeah, the bigger the tank you got, the, uh, the more temperature rise you got from the yeast. And it's just a matter of uh, a living organism uh, creating more and more heat and uh, uh, a thousand gallon tank, we uh, have to have a chiller. We have a chiller right over in the back there. I don't know if you can see that or not, but we hook that up to the tank, keeps the, uh, the
the tank at uh, for for white wines uh, 55 to 60 degrees for red wines we uh, keep it at 70 75 and uh, that uh, that makes sure that the yeast doesn't get too hot and it doesn't get too cold so now the last little thing is the way you're going to be able to tell this is fermenting is you can start seeing bubbles come up through these uh, through these airlocks and uh, right now this uh, wine is about 55 degrees and the room is about 65 degrees so uh, so the wine is heating up just from the room temperature so you're gonna see bubbles the way it is that's not fermentation that's just the expansion of both the the uh, gas inside here and the wine will will make it look like it's bubbling but uh, that's not fermentation now tomorrow you'll see uh, You'll, you'll see where there's uh, constant bubbles. And uh, if this uh, gets up to where it's fermenting fast enough, it'll just be a constant bubble, 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 bubble. All right. We are now at a point where we are just about completely fermented. And uh, as you can see, we, we have a, uh, a kind of a cloudy color in here. And what we're going to do today is we're just going to rack this into our uh, five-gallon carboy. And therefore, the, uh, the process of fermentation, which is still slightly going on, the process of fermentation will finish off in this carboy where we will not have oxygen problems because we'll have a almost full carboy. Uh, here, with the traps, you're okay for a few weeks, maybe even a month, as long as air doesn't get in there somehow. However, if you forget it, for two or three months, which <laughs> a lot of us do, there's gonna get, air's gonna get in here and it's gonna start affecting the taste of your wine. So, as I stressed many times before, we're trying to control oxygen. So we're gonna do two things today. We're gonna transfer it to a carboy and we're gonna add our Camden tablets. And we're gonna add them to this carboy so that it gets nice and mixed up. We'll put a little bit in, we'll throw two Camden tablets in there, and we will fill it the rest of the way. Right. Now, now I got the, uh, the five gallon car carboy down here. It's got to have a, uh, a difference in elevation to make this work. And now we got some nice residual grain alcohol sitting on the table here. So this hose, is its specific use is to do exactly what we're doing. And if you notice, we have a stainless steel wire in here, which helps you keep it where you want it in the bottle so that, it, so that you can get all of the wine out of it. So how we're gonna do this is we're gonna stuff it all the way in the bottle here. Okay, so you got it all the way in the bottle. Now, you bring this out. And you can see we got the, uh, we got the end of the hose right on the bottom there. And we're going to let this go, and you see what's happening. It's siphoning out of here. Okay, so now we're on the bottom. We got plenty of holes here. And uh, you try not to do any more turbulence than you have to in here, because that will, that will help oxygenate it. But you got about, uh, I think it's... Uh, seven or eight times where you can fully oxygenate, oxygenate this wine and it will be okay. Uh, versus uh, a lot of home winemakers basically let this stuff sit with oxygen, oxygen in it and uh, you know with oxygen on the top of it like this for, for long periods of time and it just starts getting that funny oxygenated taste. Okay, so uh, what we are doing here, the point of this is to fill that tank up to the top, but the other point is to leave all the sediment on the bottom here. There's a little, uh, uh, this was pretty clear juice, so there's not gonna be much in here, but I guarantee you most grape juices that you use, especially if you press your own, is gonna have like a half an inch of uh, sludge on the bottom of here, and you don't want that in the wine for very long because it will put additional, usually herbaceous flavors in it, which is like, you know, green pepper and stuff you really don't want. So uh, the, the best thing to do is to just uh, get that sludge out of there as soon as possible. 
And as a matter of fact, when we pick grapes in the vineyard, we, uh, we press them, the white grapes this is, we press them and we put, put the juice in the tank and we chill it for about a week so that it won't ferment. We chill it down to 32 degrees and it doesn't ferment. And that way, all of that stuff settles to the bottom and then we rack that off into a different tank before we even start fermenting. And that way you don't have to worry about those, uh, those flavors taking over, which uh, you don't want to take a chance at all when you're doing five or six or 700 gallons of wine. If you get them bad flavors, it's not gonna sell very well and, uh, and the bookkeepers aren't very happy. So as you can see, it's siphoning out of there really nicely. And uh, I couldn't jam that hose in there, so I actually had to, uh, I had to use a little suction on it. But, uh, but it's, it's filling really nicely, and uh, the bottom of the hose is about an inch from this bottom of the, the uh, carboy. So what we're going to do is when it gets down just above here, we're going to tip it a little bit, and we're going to keep an eye on where that sediment is. And that way, we'll, we'll get the most wine we possibly can out of this, and yet we still won't get that sludge. If you get a little bit of sludge in there, it's not going to hurt anything, but you just don't want the whole, the whole half inch of uh, thick goo in that bottle, in that carboy. All right, now we're coming down to the bottom here, so I'm just going to gently, gently start turning it. That wasn't quite as gently as I wanted, but... Uh, this, you get used to it after a while. You get used to just how much you can tip it before that sludge starts coming, coming over. And uh, it's looking like there's not hardly any sludge in this uh, juice. Which if you buy a kit, you're probably not, a white wine kit, you're probably not gonna have any sludge on those either. But like I said, if you press your own fruit and it hasn't been cold stabilized, or cold settled, I mean, uh, then you're gonna have a lot of sludge, which, uh, which, will really cause you a lot of problems if you leave it in there. Okay, we're getting there. Oh yeah, I can... You know, I'm not sure there's any, any sludge in this one. Either way, you gotta get it into the one carboy anyway. Oh yeah, there's some. Yeah, yeah there's about an eighth, an eighth of an inch of sludge in there. We're going to be filtering this uh, in the next video, so uh, you'll see where you don't want a lot of the sludge <laughs> transferring over, because if, if you filtered that sludge, it will plug up your filters right away, and you don't want to be changing your filters too often. This is working out pretty nice here. I don't see any sludge going into the end of the hose, which is right here at all, and I'm getting almost every drop out. Yep, 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 it's coming right down, coming right down there. Now we're starting to get a little sludge. So you see the sludge in there? Just like I said. And now we, we're going to uh, do the second carboy. Now at this point, before we actually put it into the big carboy, if we wanted to protect this wine, through, through the alcohol, we could just put more sugar in here and let it keep on fermenting until the fermenting stopped because, because of the high alcohol. Uh, a lot of people do this. It's, a, it's actually, if you don't mind drinking the higher alcohol content, it's a really good way to keep your wine from re-fermenting because it can't anymore. Yeast can't live in there and also the high alcohol controls bacteria as well. So uh, a lot of home winemakers do this and uh, I don't have a problem with it because I don't mind drinking the higher alcohol. Uh, a lot of our reds are already just about that high anyway. So uh, a lot of um, lighter wine drinkers will not tolerate that much alcohol though. And uh, to me, I, I will agree on a nice hot summer day when you want a white wine out in the sun, you don't want 17% alcohol in it. So, uh, so me, I take it, and uh, what we do is we, we put it all into that carboy, we let it settle for about two or three or four more weeks, and then, uh, and then finish the little tiny bit of fermentation that's left, and then we add our sugar, 
and then we sterile filter it. We add our sugar so that it tastes where we want it to taste, and then we uh, sterile filter it and then bottle it. And uh, once you sterile filter it, that keeps the, uh, that filters all the old yeast out and therefore it can't re-ferment. And now I say that, but uh, that's a lot, a lot easier said than done. Normally, I would sterile filter about three times in order for that to not re-ferment. Uh, and I, I've got a little sterile uh, filtering machine that uh, anybody can buy. It's, uh, I think I paid like $100 for it. And if you like lighter wines without a lot of alcohol, it's, uh, it's worth the investment. And that will be in the next video too. But I will uh, take a look at it and I'll put it down on the, uh, put it down in the description so that uh, if you want to take a look at it ahead of time, you can. Uh, a very simple little pump, very simple little filtration system. And I used it for years before I actually started my own winery. And the one thing I did not stress when we first started was labeling. Uh, if you have if you have any amount of wine whatsoever, you should label them and every time you do something to it, such as add sugar, add uh, Camden tablets, anything like that, you write all that stuff down on the label, you never lose track and you know what you got. Now if we don't have quite enough wine in here, what we can do to fill that last little space is we can actually add water. If we had a different wine, we could add a different wine to it, as long as it didn't change the flavor too much. But uh, it doesn't hurt to put a little bit of water in there to, to uh, fill that last little bit in the carboy. Okay, so now we've gotten as much out of these three gallon carboys as we possibly could. And uh, we have, we have, we're about uh, two inches down below the neck. And uh, uh, that's probably a cup. And basically you're adding a cup, you're adding eight ounces of water to five gallons of wine, which uh, that's not really gonna hurt you. At the winery here, of course, we're just gonna add, we're just gonna add a little bit more wine from a different tank in order, if we had to do something like this. Uh, we do that all the time with the closed top tanks. We will just uh, top it off with a neutral, a more neutral wine, bring it up so that we don't have any airspace. Uh, yes, this also gets done with our big tanks. Uh, if you have a tank that's got a uh, six foot diameter and you've got a, a gas space all the way across the top, any little bit of oxygen in there is going to start oxidizing the wine. So we're going to put, we're going to put uh, five ounces of water in there. And, uh, and we're gonna bring it right up to the top. And then, because it's still fermenting slightly, we're going to uh, we're gonna put the, uh, the trap back on with our alcohol level in it. And uh, it, uh, it'll, at this point, there's, there's so much, so little sugar in it that uh, it's not gonna ferment very fast. So you don't have to worry anymore about it um, boiling over like you do at first. At this point, at this point, uh, we're pretty much, uh, pretty much finished with this. Uh, these are quite heavy, so uh, you, you definitely want to have clean hands when you pick them up so that you don't drop them. And uh, like, like I said before, you can see here it's a little bit low. We're just going to dump some nice clean, clean water in here until we get right here. And then, uh, then we can just leave it sit here for, uh, oh... It's, it's the safest to leave it sit like this for about six weeks and then filter it because that way you'll know for sure that uh, it's all settled out. It's completely fermented, so you're going to get, you know, we measure, remember we measured our bricks. It was 21 bricks. And if you, me if you calculate, uh, some yeasts are different than others, but my yeast uh, that I used, uh, that will um, give you uh, 0.58 uh, 0.58 uh, percent alcohol per bricks. So you just calculate that out and that brings you to just about 12 percent. So, uh, so you want this completely fermented so you are at that 12 percent so you can actually control it. Now I'll show you a little gadget in our next video that uh, we use in the winery, so for $1,000 you could buy one too. It's, it's just a nebuliometer, 
And what it does is it compares, uh, it compares the boiling point of pure water to the boiling point of the wine. And the lower the boiling point, the more alcohol that you have in it. And then it's got a little wheel chart that you use to calculate the exact alcohol. But I'll tell you one thing, based on experience, calculating your alcohol based on initial sugar is actually more accurate than the ebulliometer. While you were sleeping before, <laughs> in between I added the Camden tablet. I added one Camden tablet initially. I'm going to add one more and throw it in there. And uh, basically when we uh, When we carry this over there, and when you, you probably should stir it around, but uh, this, uh, well, yeah, it's uh, it's fizzing. So this, it actually is uh, dissolving in there, and it's uh, it's off gassing right now. You can see the bubbling going on. But this is the Camden tablet. Uh, don't eat them. <laughs> These. Uh, what these do is they add sulfur dioxide to your wine. So uh, a few things about winemaking before we go into it. First off, you gotta love it. If you don't love winemaking, uh, realistically when you first start, you're not gonna see a whole lot of savings by making your own wine. And if you don't do it very carefully or you just happen to have one of those problems that pop up for no reason, you can end up dumping a whole batch of wine away, which would cost you a lot of money and a lot of headache. However, if it's something you might enjoy, it is a very rewarding experience. Uh, Winemaking, when you, when you finish a wine and you take that first taste and it, uh, it, just like, it just like goes down your, across your palate and you get that burst of fruit, it's just such a rewarding experience, and uh, then you're uh, you're all proud. And you know, back in my old days, I would uh, bring a half a glass of uh, you know almost completely fermented wine to my wife and let her taste it. And uh, of course, she uh, she wasn't too impressed at some of my first batches, but uh, but eventually she started becoming a believer. Uh, eventually, I started producing some very good wines, even in my basement. And, uh, I just got happier and happier with it. And then once we started uh, this project, uh, then I started getting really serious about it. Started making wines that I thought might might work out at the winery really well. And, and that, uh, that was even more exciting. So uh, if you like making wine, that's where I started. And look where I ended up. It's, uh, it's a job that uh, I wouldn't trade for anything. So, uh, with that all being said, uh, good luck, and uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you stay with it, and I hope you make some great wine.